So again, my name is Caitlin Kaluja. I run the marketing team for Shipple, the web marketing company, and Tendency, our open source CMS software for nonprofits. Um, I used to run the search engine marketing team before that. So analytics are sort of near and dear to my heart. So hopefully this is, um, I, I can give you kind of some insight on that. There's a picture of me. Since you can't see me, that's what I look like. Um, and my whole bio is at shipple.com slash QK. I'm sure it's not, it's, it's, that's, this is what you need to know about me. But if you, if you feel like learning more, um, it's, you can. So we're talking about Google Analytics today. And the biggest question that I get when clients log into Google Analytics is they get in there and they think, oh, these reports are great, but what am I supposed to do with all of this data? What a, you know, I have so many reports. What, what how do I even start to process this information? So today, hopefully, we'll be able to answer some of that. So today we're going to cover getting started with Google Analytics, some reports to focus on. You've got, um, we're going to talk through some kind of, there are tons and tons of reports and we're going to pick probably five or six that are the most important ones to kind of look at and keep an eye on and pay attention to as you're looking in your analytics. We're going to talk about goal tracking, some benchmarks from our clients. This is based solely on our client base. So, I, I, you know, your mileage may vary, but these are these are benchmarks that we kind of see and we kind of recommend after working with clients over the years. Um, again, making decisions with this information. What am I supposed to do with all this data? And then we'll talk a little bit about A-B testing. And if we have time at the end, I've got a couple of other cool analytics tools that are not necessarily Google Analytics, but they're, you know, other, other tools that we've been using. And I'll, I'll share some of those as well. So let's talk getting started. Um, the first thing I want to mention is why Google Analytics? Why, why do we recommend Google Analytics in the first place? The first thing is it's sort of the standard in analytics. It, you get your information directly from Google. Google is, I think, 70% of all searches in the world happen through Google. So that if you're going to get your data from anybody, Google is a great place to do it. Also, Google Analytics is completely free. So we set it up for all of our client websites. And we launch a website. We sort of set them up on Google Analytics because you know, it's free and it gives you really valuable data. And it's definitely the most popular analytics tool. So the way that Google Analytics works is you embed a piece of JavaScript code on each page of your website. And that JavaScript, when somebody goes to your site and load, it goes to a page and loads that JavaScript, it transmits data back to Google, which it kind of records in analytics. So if you are, this is a tendency webinar, so I'm going to talk a, a few in a few places about specific things to using tendency with Google Analytics, but um, this is, 90% of this is going to be applicable no matter what website, you know, if you're using WordPress or Drupal or anything like that. So um, what, no matter what your website's built on, it will be helpful for tendency. Um, like I said, for our clients that are the websites that are created through Shipple, we do that for you. It's sort of part of our go live process. We put this code on your template and we sort of set, set it up for you. If you are a Shipple client and you don't have access to your Google Analytics, uh, shoot me an email at the end of this and I'll help you get set up and make sure you have access to your stuff. Um, for everybody else, essentially, you go to google.com slash analytics, set up an account. It gives you a little piece of code and it... Um, you can add it to, if you're using a CMS software, you can put it on the template that shows on every page, and then that, that tracking code is on every page. If you're using something like WordPress or Drupal, there are plugins that you can use. Like There's one called Google Analytics for WordPress that you just copy and paste the little code, and it kind of does all the heavy lifting for you. So um, that's sort of basically getting, getting started with Google Analytics. And then another thing, then my number three here, and we'll get into this in, in a little more detail later, is setting up goal tracking is, is a good way to get kind of the most out of analytics. So speaking of tendency websites and Google Analytics, what is the difference between the reports that tendency gives you versus the reports that Google Analytics gives you? Well, okay, so I mentioned that the way that Google Analytics works is you put a little piece of JavaScript on your pages, and then when a browser hits it, it transmits that data back. So essentially what that means is that Google Analytics is reporting data from people because 
a brow every time a person hits a browser that's when google analytics records that data for tendency the data comes from the database so it's actually coming from the software itself so it's coming from instead of on the front end of a user hitting the hitting the page it's coming out of the queries that happen on the database. So what that means to you is that tenancy reports on things like uh, things that can have that happen behind the login. Google can Google sees data that's public, and so Google can't really report on things like you know like this invoice report that we have showing because that data is not. You have to log in to get that data. It's a little harder for Google to have that data. So Tendency does a great job with things like invoice reports and membership reports. And um, this report down here that's the top spend, you know, who's donating the most on your website, that kind of, anything that has to do with something that happens after somebody's logged in, Tendency is probably going to do a better job of reporting on that. Google Analytics is more for like front end visitors, visits, things that are happening kind of on, on the public facing side of it. So let's start with just a little bit of basics and I'm going to click over to Google Analytics. So here I go. And again, if, if I say I'm doing something and you don't see it, let me know it. Type in the chat box if there's, there tends to be a little bit of a lag on GoToMeeting. So uh, if, you, if you don't see it after a few seconds, let me know. So to get started, I'm at google.com slash analytics. I'm going to click sign in. And I'm going to sign in. And I am going to pick, we're going to look at the Tendency blog as sort of our example site today. Okay, so you see when I log in, I'm on this reporting tab right here, and I can see sort of basic traffic over the last 30 days. Note that it's showing me traffic over the last 30 days ending with yesterday because today's not over yet so it's not really fair to look at today um, and so just be aware that that's what you're looking at um, there's this thing called dashboards and I'm going to go into my dashboard so Google Analytics in in the new version of Google Analytics and by new I mean in the last year or year and a half they've um, updated the interface now you have this sort of dashboard where you can you can drag these reports around and you can reorder them and you can add, you know, customize what reports you see. This is actually something that when I log into Google Analytics, I don't I don't use the dashboard. I, I will confess I tend to just go straight to the report I want, but a lot of people love dashboards. So if you want to set up your dashboard based on some of these reports that, you know, as I'm as I'm going through and saying, okay, these are the reports you should focus on. If you want to add these to your dashboard, you can. And the way that you do that, and I'll just pick from any report. So I just picked a random report. At the top, there's this little add to dashboard button. So I just want to go through that sort of basic stuff. You've got a dashboard. Any report you look at, you can add it to your dashboard. Also, any report, if you are a lot of our clients who manage the website, they have a lot of, they wear a lot of different hats. They're doing a lot of different things in their organization. They don't necessarily want to go into analytics every day and kind of look at data. So another thing you can do is if there's a report that you're, as we go through, you're like, oh, this is really important to me. This is really interesting. This is something I want to keep an eye on. You can click email and you can set up an automatic email where analytics will email you that report. Um, I recommend using the PDF version because it's a little easier to read. And then you can pick daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. So you can get, you know, you can get a report on Monday morning, every Monday that's got kind of the, the basics of your website. If you, if it's easier, that's a lot easier for people sometimes than remembering to log in and look at analytics every week or every month or every whatever. So let me flip back over. So that's just some basics. Click your add to dashboard, add it to your dashboard, set up your email. You have lots of options there. Now we're going to get into some definitions. So we've been looking at some reports just super briefly. We haven't even really uh, dived, dove in, dove right, <laughs> dove right into it too, too much. But I want to talk about some basic definitions of some of the reports you'll see. So visits are the number of 
instances of a visit, which just means that if me, if, if I, Caitlin, go to your website three times this week, that counts as three visits, even though I'm only one person. So visits are, you know, the unique number of, of visits that happened, not necessarily people. It could be the same person going, you know, you may, there are certain websites I'm sure some of you go to every single day or several times a day, um, like Facebook or something like that. And so a visit is just a sort of unique instance of a visit. Now, a page view is the total views of all of your pages. So if, um, if I go to your website and I go to three pages, that's one visit, three page views. So, it's, so the visit is that um, the whole time that you spend on the site and page views is each time you go to a unique individual page, it counts as a page view. And even if like I go to the homepage and then I click on the contact form and then I go back to the homepage, that's three page views because I went to three different pages, even though, you know, even I, though I went to the homepage twice. So that's kind of how that works. Um, the third one on our list, pages per visit, are the number of pages viewed in the average visit. So the average person to your website visits, you know, however many pages, two pages, three pages, four pages. We'll talk a little bit about benchmarks in just a second of kind of what what is a good number for these. Uh, the next one is bounce rate. So bounce rate means that someone went to your website and they, they, you know, they landed on a page. It's probably your home page, and they didn't see anything that they wanted to click on. They didn't click on anything. They, they just left. You know, they land. Maybe they clicked from an ad or they clicked from an organic search result, and it wasn't what they were looking for, so they just left. So that's what bounce rate is. So for bounce rate, the the higher it is, the worse it is. You know, you want that bounce rate to be low because that means that fewer people bounced, more people stayed. And again, we'll get into some benchmarks for that in just a second. So the last definition we're going to go through is new visits. And new visits means that this, again, when you're, when we set up Google Analytics in the first place, we put a piece of JavaScript code on a page. So every time Google sees a new browser, it counts that as a new, a new visitor. So you have to kind of take that take that with a grain of salt because probably you're like me and you have a home computer, a work computer, a cell phone, an iPad, you know, you have all these different devices and you maybe use Chrome, Safari, Firefox, IE, whatever browser you use. Every time Google sees a new browser, it counts that as a new person. So you do kind of, you know, new visits are a good way to kind of see have these people been to your site? You know, are they new people? Are they old people? Are they the same returning people? But you do kind of want to take it with a grain of salt because, like I said, every time you go to a website in a new browser, Google counts you as a new person. Any questions on those definitions so far? I haven't seen anything in the chat box. So if you have any questions, like I said, feel free. Feel free to type them in. We're going to keep rolling through with some engagement benchmarks. So that bounce rate and pages per visit, those are really sort of metrics of engagement. How how much time are people spending on your site? How like how engaged are they? How interested are they in your content? Uh, we recommend a bounce rate. Try to get your bounce rate under 50%. And what that means is, again, higher is bad. So if, if your bounce rate's under 50%, that means that less than half of the people who come to your website leave immediately. So more than half of the people who come to your website see something interesting and they want to click for more and they want to learn more about you. So that's kind of why why we pick that or why we recommend that 50% mark. Um, the other one on this page is pages per visit recommendation and we want that to be above two. So again, if on average people go to at least one other page other than your homepage, then that's that's good because it, <clears throat> that too may seem kind of low. But if you think about it, how often do you go to a website, you know, search for something in search results, click, don't see what you want, go back, click, don't see what you want, you know. So if, if you can get them engaged enough where on average they're going to at least one other page, you know, you've got them hooked where they're taking the risk to click on one other page, then you're in a good place. So, you know, two is good, three is better. This example we've got up here is um, just sort of it's just an example of somebody I pulled, but they've got their bounce rate in a good place. They've got their pages per visit in a good place. And it's sort of just sort of some some benchmarks for how you're how to say, okay, well, what is my bounce rate? And if your bounce rate is really high, then that means that it, what that usually means is people got to your website and they didn't know what to do. So they got there and they didn't, there wasn't a contact page or there wasn't, they weren't sure what they were supposed to do. So give them some sort of call to action or maybe rethink your navigation and think about 
you know, who, what are these people when they get there, what, what should they be doing next? So next we're going to go into our reporting. So we're going to look at some, I'm going to pull up some reports and kind of show you the top, the most important reports that you should take a look at. Um, again, if you have questions, type them in the chat box as we roll along. Uh, we split these top reports into three kind of categories. The first one's traffic. The second one is audience. Who, who, so where do people come from? Who are these people? Where are they? What kind of devices are they on? And then we're going to talk about keywords and content, which is kind of a big, a big chunk of it. So I, I put it, as, I put it last, not because it's less important, but because it's kind of a, a big meaty piece. And so I want to make sure that we have enough time to get through it. So I'm going to, um, so it's third, not because it's least important, but you know, because there's a lot to talk about. So let's talk traffic trends. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is traffic pattern. How many patterns, how many visits came to your site? I'm going to flip over to our Google Analytics. So as I mentioned, let me go back to the beginning. Okay. So when you first log in, it's going to look a little bit like this. And as I mentioned, you've got, <clears throat> you're looking at the last 30 days of data. So probably you want to look at a little bit more than that. So I'm going to look and I'm going to filter this to the last, let's do last quarter, April, May, June. And I just hit apply. And then I can see my sort of data over time. You'll see that it's defaulted to daily. I can change that to weekly. And so I'll get one dot for every week. And um, sometimes I do that when I'm looking at, you know, if I'm looking at a whole year's worth of data, I may say, okay, show me everything that happened this year, January 1 through today, hit apply and do monthly and kind of see what the trend looks like month over month. Sometimes I'll use that monthly tab, but mostly sticking to day is, is fine. Um, so let me go back to my example where I'm going to filter it to last quarter, April, May, June. So now it's good to look at your data over time to see what's happening, you kind of want to look about once a month, you know, look at how did this month do compared to last month, you know, how, where were we in June versus May, but you also really want to be aware of yearly trends, because if you are a business that in December, everybody goes on vacation for Christmas and disappears, then if you compare January to December, it's going to look like January had this huge spike, but it wasn't really it's not really accurate. It's just because December was really low. So you have to kind of pay attention to what's happening year over year. Um, whatever is my rule of thumb is what's happening online should sort of match what's happening offline. So again, if your business, if your partners or your clients are sort of MIA in the month of December, you probably won't get a ton of traffic in the month of December. On the other hand, if you're a nonprofit and you get 50% of your donations in December, then you should get a lot of online traffic in December. So it just sort of depends on your business. Um, the best thing you can do is kind of measure against yourself. Google sort of helps us out with that. So as you see, my date range is last quarter. And then I can check this little box here and do compare to. The default is previous period. So you'll see it says, oh, you want three months? I'm going to give you, I'm going to compare it to the three months before that. And you'll see that it does, um, it actually does the number of days. So you see that it went back to December 31st instead of January 1st so that the, you know, the days are exactly the same. The other option you have here is previous year. And so you can pretty easily say, okay, show me this quarter of this year compared, you know, Q2 of this year compared to Q2 of last year. And then it's really easy to compare data and look at, you know, our visitors increased and our unique visitors increased and our page views increased and our bounce rate went down and look at all this great news. So, um, when you're looking at traffic trends, again, I recommend looking at sort of month over month and comparing not just month over month, but that same time period year over year as well. Let's see, flipping back. So next we're going to talk about, oh, let me, let me talk really briefly about notes. So let's see, and we have one in here. So if you see really, if you look really closely, you'll see this little note guy right here. If I click on that, it pops open. And it says homepage updated with featured image. So what we did is on the blog, we updated the homepage so that instead of just showing the post that has a little featured image next to it, I added a little note so that I can kind of tell if I don't know if that will increase traffic or I don't know if that will increase anything. But my guess is that any change like that that we make to the homepage or any big campaign we do, it's good to add a little annotation note in here so that if you go back 
I promise you in two months, I'm not going to remember what day we did that or what month we did that. So it's good to get in the habit of if you make big changes to your website or if you have a big, um, if you have a, even if you have a billboard campaign and it's got your website on it, I would, I would add as much detail here as you can. It's really easy. You just click create new annotation. You can pick a date and then you can say, you know, like, we'll say radio campaign started. And then I tend to put my initials just because it's a shared account that we all use. Um, but if you're a team of one, it may not necessarily make sense to add your initials. And then you can you can hit save and it will save that annotation and add that little note right here on your timeline. So the next report we're gonna look at is traffic sources. So this is where Google Analytics tells you where people came from. And so there, it, Google Analytics breaks it down into these three categories. These are two different examples, so don't get confused that they're in one screenshot. Um, the three categories that Google Analytics uses are traffic from search engines, traffic from referring sites, and direct traffic. And direct traffic means people typed in your URL, they knew you, they typed in tendency.com, they typed in you know your URL.com, or maybe they had it bookmarked and so they get there kind of directly. So that's what direct traffic is. Referring sites means they clicked from another website to get to you. So maybe you were linked on, somebody wrote, um, maybe you were linked in an article in an online news publication and somebody clicked over, or maybe somebody recommended you on, in a Yelp review, or maybe somebody posted some of your content on Facebook. You know, any a referring site is any website that they clicked on your link to get um, or somewhere else on the web to get to you. And then search engines means they searched in a search engine, either either paid traffic or unpaid traffic. It sort of lumps those together. So that's what this this breakdown is. Uh, we recommend about 60 to 75 percent of your traffic come from search engines, and that's based on so direct traffic. They obviously know who you are. They you know they know enough to they know your URL. They're typing you in directly. Referring site somebody sort of vouched for you. You know they clicked on a link somewhere where. Um, they, someone, yeah, vouched for you and said, you know, go here. And then search engines tends to be newer people, people who are just learning about you, who typed in, you know, maybe they typed in wedding photography Houston and they happen to sort of stumble across your website. Um, so because those people tend to be newer, you want, we want more of them because they're, they're strangers. So they're going to convert a little bit less than the other group. So we want more of them. This top graph right here is a good example of kind of what we would recommend. They've got 70% search engine traffic and the other two are kind of split evenly. Um, this example down here on the bottom, they have a lot more direct traffic than sort of average. This is actually a client that did a billboard campaign and they had their, their URL all over their billboard. So people were typing in their billboard, you know, typing in their URL directly, counting as direct traffic. So even things you're doing offline should sort of affect this mix. But again, sort of on average, the if I you know, yeah, I can't say this enough, your mileage may vary, things are different depending on different industries, but kind of in general, this 60 to 75% search engine traffic, the other two split down the middle is a, is a good place to be. Traffic sources also show you what pages link to you. So speaking of these referring sites, who is actually linking, who's linking to you, who is, who, what links are bringing in traffic. This is for one of our clients, Miller Outdoor Theater, and they do a really great job of people, you know, they put on performances and they're free and they're great things to do in Houston. And so they're linked all over the web on Visit Houston, Texas. You know, there's a link there on things to do in Houston, on Facebook, the Houston First Theaters, they're linked um, on Houston's about, you know, about.com page with Tuts, they're Houston on the cheap, they get linked all over the place. So you can kind of look at that data and see who is linking to you, who is bringing in traffic, and then from the people that came in from visithoustontexas.com, how much time are they spending on your site? What, you know, how many pages per visit is that specific subset of people getting to? And let's, I'll show you how to, how to do that report. So we're going to go to traffic sources. We'll start with overview. So here's our, here's our pie. And then we're going to go to sources and let's click on referrals. Oh, you'll see that I still have my, I still have my Q2 2013 versus Q2 2012 set up. So it's actually showing me two points of data. That gets a little crazy. It's, this is good if you're looking at graphs, but if you're trying to drill down into data, it's, it's a little hard to read. So I, I tend to just sort of uh, not compare data. Let's do the month of July. 
So these are our top referring referring sites. So you'll see this is again the the tenancy blog. So shipple.com, tenancy.com, when well, you see some of our clients in there, you see our Facebook page in there, um, you see our GitHub page in there, our support uh, portal in there, you see all kinds of stuff in there. So now let's talk about some fun stuff. Let's talk about social sources. So this, when you're looking in traffic sources, this is sort of a new report. And again, we're in traffic sources over here and you'll see this social. And I'm gonna click overview. So this tells me how many visits came in from social media. And you can see kind of what Google Analytics defines as social media, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, LinkedIn. On some of our other ones, we've seen Reddit, we've seen, um, YouTube, uh, you know, pretty much any social network sort of counts in here. And this shows you specifically data about the traffic that came in from social media. So if you're doing a lot of work on social media and you say, oh, I have, you know, 5,000 fans, are those people actually coming to my website ever? You can kind of see how many visits came in from social media, um, how many came in through, and you'll see I can kind of hover over here and it tells me what each of those are. So then how many conversions came in through that? Uh, social media traffic, which we'll talk about goals and conversions in, in just a minute. But if you've got that set up, it will show you how many conversions came in. Um, so this is interesting. This These last two right here that both show zero in this example, but I think I have data on my keynotes. Let me flip over. Oh, no, those show zero too. Well, so last interaction social conversion means that somebody, so let's say they clicked to your website from Facebook. They went from Facebook, they clicked to your website, and then they, you know, they filled out a contact form, they converted. So that means that the last interaction, the last time they came to your website and they actually filled out that contact form, they came from Facebook. Contributed social conversions means, so again, Google puts a little cookie in your browser so it knows if you're a new visitor, it knows if you've been there before. It doesn't necessarily know, it doesn't report like that Caitlin Kalusia at 1175 Katy Freeway came to your website before, but it sort of in aggregate, it knows like this, this person, this uh, browser came here before. It, it reports anonymous data, but it, you know, it knows that you've come there before. So if you came to the website from social media, and then later you came back and you converted, then that counts as a contributed social conversion. So I'll say that again. So if a contributed social conversion means that this person came to your website before using social media, but not on this last time when they actually converted. So that social media, it contributed to their brand impression of you and it was probably helpful in getting them to convert. But if you were just traditionally looking at how many, you know, people who came from Facebook and then filled out a contact form, you wouldn't show up because you came here from Facebook like a week ago or four days ago or however long ago. Um, so that's what that contributed social conversions means. So it's a good way of looking at Maybe the first time they found out about you, they came from social media, but the time that they actually decided to fill out a contact form or to, you know, donate, donate money or, you know, whatever, that time they didn't actually come from social media, it will count as contributed. Okay, so that's sort of part one. That's traffic sources. If you, if you have any questions on that, again, type in the chat box. I'm going to keep, keep rolling along a little bit here. So first, when we talk about audience demographics, we're going to talk about geography. So when you look at geography of where your client or where your your visitors are coming from, you, it should, again, what's happening online should match what's happening offline. It should be similar. So if you are Tony Sachery's Creole seasoning, you should see lots of traffic from Texas and Louisiana. That's not, it's not super surprising. If you're a Think LA, you should see lots of traffic in LA. That's, you know, so you kind of want to look at when you're looking at these reports, is it what you expected? And then where is the opportunity? So if you're Tony Sachery's, well, what about these other states in the South, like Mississippi or Alabama? Maybe that's, there's opportunity there where we're not getting as much traffic as we thought we would be. So what can we do to sort of boost our online presence in those states or in those cities or in those places? So to pull that report, we're going to, we're still in, we're going to go to audience. So anytime we're talking about the the sort of tabs over here, traffic sources, content, audience, they're pretty easy to follow. You just think about, you know, we're looking at the geography of where the audience members live. So th that's under audience. We're going to go demographics location. You can also filter down to language if that's important to your to your business. If you want to look at people who are, you know, have their computer settings set to whatever language. Usually for us, location is a little bit more important. 
So again, we're on the tendency blog. So lots of love in the United States, not surprising. And then mostly Texas. And I'm just clicking in. I clicked on location and it started with country and you can just click to kind of drill down into more. If you want to go directly into, you can also use these little, these little tiny primary dimension things. You can click and, and drill down that way as well. So we'll see Houston, you'll see a little bit of some other some other cities in there. New York, LA, Washington, Dallas. Um, anytime you see this not set on a report, that means that Google, when I log into Google, you'll see that I have this HTTPS, this secure connection to Google. If I am logged in and I have that HTTPS, um, it, Google will not always filter back my Google Analytics data to analytics because I'm logged in and I'm in a secure connection. It will, if I'm logged in, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't send my data back. And sort of what we recommend is we take this, this not set. Um, there's not much we can do about that. There's not much we can do to figure out what that, what is within that not set grouping. So we just sort of assume that it's based on, you know, if Houston and New York are the top cities overall, then they're probably the top cities within not set as well. So we just sort of, um, we still report on it, but we, we, there's, there's not a lot we can do about that not set. Google's not reporting the data. So we sort of assume that it matches the, um, the it matches what's going on with, outside of the not set group. And so it's probably similar. So if you see that not set, don't freak out is what I'm trying to say. So we talked a little bit about geography. Now let's talk about mobile. Oh, another note on geography. This is probably not something you need to look at like every week. This is probably not something that's going to change super dramatically, you know, week to week, unless you're doing some sort of ad campaign where you're saying, oh, I'm targeting this new state or this new city. Then I would, you know, keep a close eye on it. But in general, if you're targeting a certain geographical area, you want to keep an eye on it, you know, maybe once a month, once a quarter, but it's, you're probably not going to see a ton of shifts and changes you know, on, on a quick timeline. So mobile is a fun report. Mobile is growing. Obviously, this is an example of a nonprofit website that has 81% mobile traffic. That is crazy. That is, that is so high. Most of our clients are not nearly that high. I'm going to show you how to pull the mobile data reports. And we're going to look at a couple of quick benchmarks. We work with a lot of nonprofit websites. Our nonprofit clients have about an average of in, in Q1, this is a sampling of probably about 50 or 60 of our nonprofit clients. And um, we saw an average of 27% mobile traffic in Q1 of 2013. So that's just, again, that's a benchmark that's based on our data that we saw that sort of across the board for our nonprofits. Um, but if you are a nonprofit and you're looking at your data, I would expect to see about that number. Um, overall, all of the web traffic, about 13% is mobile. So if you're B2B, if you're a business, um, you, I would expect about that about that 13%. Um, another interesting benchmark is that our nonprofit clients have seen a 30% increase in mobile traffic. So it's definitely growing and it's growing quickly. So let's look at some mobile stats. So we're going to go in, again, we're in audience now. We're looking at audience demographics. We're going to go to mobile and overview. Now, this is just a quick tip on Google Analytics. This is something that I think is sort of weird and, and um, I don't know, interesting. So when I first click on mobile, it's showing me sort of whether something is a desktop, mobile, or a tablet. So all of it's showing me everything, essentially. So if I look at this percent of total, that's 100% because it's showing me everything. It's showing me, is it mobile or is it not? So everything adds up to 100. So if you actually want to see that percentage number of how much of your traffic is mobile, all you have to do is click into one of these reports. So if I click devices, now the number shows me percent of total for just mobile. So that's just a just a quick tip. If you click mobile overview, you're always going to see 100% there. Click into another report and then it will show you just it will filter down to just mobile traffic. So from here, oh, I'm in the devices report. I can see what is the most popular device, um, mobile device that has visited my website. I see iPad, iPhone. We see this not set again. Again, we're not going to worry about that the Droid 4, the Galaxy S3, Galaxy S4, all kinds of different um, devices in here. And then you'll see I have a couple of other options like brand, provider, input selector. 
Um, the other one that I will look at, so I'll look at devices and I'll look at operating system. And operating system sort of lumps all of the, it lumps all of the Apple devices together, all of the Androids together, all the Blackberries together, et cetera. So a lot of times for clients, if you look at just straight up device, iPad or iPhone is going to be at the top of your list. But if you filter down into operating system, a lot of times Android, if you lumped all those Androids together, they actually show up higher. So if you're thinking about things like, well, we were thinking about if we should have a mobile app and we can't decide if we should start with iOS or Android, um, this is a good place to look and see, well, how much of my traffic really is coming from those sources? Which one is more pop, you know, more popular? You may think it's one way, but it's really the other. Which group is spending more time on my site? All, all that good stuff is in here. So let's see, we can see the iPad is actually outpacing the iPhone, which is kind of surprising to me. I would expect, I would expect the iPhone to be higher, but again, you can, you can sort of verify the data. So I wanted to share one more mobile, one more mobile sort of trend. This is something that we are noticing more and more in 2013. So mobile has been growing. Mobile has been growing for years. Mobile is huge. Um, something that's sort of different about mobile that we're seeing now that's different than we've been seeing, seeing before. When mobile websites first came out, people wanted, people expected very simple, like, I just want directions to your business and I just want contact information. I just want it very, very simple. Well, nowadays, mobile users want the same experience. And what we mean by that is, so this report on the right, this is one of our summer camp clients and they're awesome. And the, the data in blue, so what I've done is I filtered it by, filtered the pages by operating system. So you can see that um, this, this one right here is Windows and the next guy is iOS. So essentially the, the ones that are highlighted in blue are desktop, are, are desktop um, users and the ones highlighted in purple are mobile users. And you can see if I look at the top four pages of desktop users, homepage, find camp, what's happening, directories, and the top four pages of mobile users, it's the same. Homepage, what's happening, directories, find camp. So what we're seeing in the data is that whether you're on a desktop, whether you're on a mobile, whether you're um, no matter what device you're on, you're sort of expecting the same experience. You're not expecting the super simple website. You're expecting to be able to get to all of the content. And some of that is also because 85% of mobile users say they watch TV with their devices. So what that means is that what we're kind of finding is that the concept of this second screen that a lot of people are sitting on their couches between 6 and 9 p.m. in front of their TV playing on their iPad or playing on their phone. So they're not exactly you know, there are still a good number of people who are out on the go, but that a good majority of people are sitting at home. They just don't want to get up and go to their computer. They they would rather access it on their phone or on their tablet. So that's just a trend in, um, I would expect you to kind of see that similar data in analytics. Um, also, one thing that we're seeing is that Google is rewarding mobile content in mobile search results. So if you have a mobile optimized website, you're getting shown a little bit more in mobile search results. So um one thing that we're also seeing with clients is if it's if you have a mobile optimized website that you tend to see more mobile traffic just sort of by nature of having that because Google's showing you more you're training people that they you know that they can come back to your website over and over again they can get that data on a mobile site so just some, some sort of mobile these are things that are that are very new that are very different in 2013 that are different from what we were looking what we were seeing what we were talking about even you know a year ago so um, just wanted to wanted to throw that out there as well so well, we have a quick quick question to show where how we get to that mobile data one more time. So I'm going to show it to you one more time. Um, so we're under audience. We're in the audience tab and then mobile right here. So that's where we were. OK, so let's talk about keywords and content. And again, I left this for the end, not because it's the least important, but because it is very important. And I want to make sure that we, you know, we can really, really dive into it. So the first report we're going to look at is the top content report. And I will show you how to get there. So we're going to close our audience tab and go into content, site content, all pages. So this just shows me, again, I'm in the month of July, what pages were the most popular. And again, this is, um, this is a blog, and so you'll see blog posts, so it's going to look a little bit different. I'm actually going to flip to a different website because I think it's a little easier to see. 
Oops, I clicked on the wrong one. No, not that one either. This one. So these are our friends at Brennan's. They're amazing. Go eat there for restaurant week next month. It is delicious food. Um, they're a really good example because I think their pages are really easy to tell kind of what they are. So I'm looking at the top content. This top one that's just a slash, that's your homepage. You should sort of expect to see your homepage at the top. Most people are going to enter your website in through your homepage, or even if they entered in from another page, they're probably going to go to your homepage at one point in time. So you should see this homepage kind of up at the top. For Brennan's, you'll see things like their dinner menu, their events, their full menu, their brunch menu, their tour, you know, lunch down here at the bottom, specific events and things like that in this, in this um, list of top content. The other report that you can look at if so these are based on visits or sorry based on page views so again if i go to your website and i end up at you know if i go to your homepage, go to another page back to your homepage, page that's two page views for your homepage. so um based on page views and um they're listed by url so you can see the unique url right here so something else that we like to look at other than just top pages is this content drill down so i'm going to click on content drill down so with this you can see that these guys, it shows me it has like a little folder icon. What that means is that it's showing me data based on what was what is the first part of the URL? What is the first kind of element in the URL? So if you're on a if you have a tendency website, all of your events will have the URL slash event slash a number. All of your photos will have the URL slash photo slash a number. All of your, you know, news articles will have the URL slash news slash, you know, something. So this is a good way to tell if you're looking at, so if no single event showed up on that, or, you know, sort of toward the bottom of that top 10 list, we started to see some events. No single event was up, you know, high, high in the top content. But if we aggregated all of their event pages together, it's actually the second most popular type of content on the site. So this is a good way to see what types of content are interesting. So you might even see, you know, maybe if all of your photos were aggregated together, they actually get more traffic than your homepage. That's that's pretty common that we see that if you're using your photos module, if you're using your events module or using your videos module, you know, a lot, you, it's common to see those kind of things happen. And this is a good way, especially if you're using tendency because of the way the URL structure is set up, um, this sort of aggregates all of that module content together. So again, for, for this example, if you looked at all of their events together, it would be the most the second most popular page on the site, even though maybe no single event was is really all that high in the in the listings. You can also do this sort of with tendency event logs as well. And um, again, as we were talking about a minute ago, tendency event logs pull data from the database. If you're not familiar with tendencies event logs, you go under reports and then event log summary. And this shows you essentially how many times this content was served up by the database. So that could mean by a person, it could mean by a search engine spider, it could mean by, you know, if you search for content or if you pull a feed of content, you know, anytime that content was sort of touched at all. And so this is color coded and it shows you by module as well. So orange is events, turquoise is the homepage, red is help files. You know, this is another kind of way that you can see which modules are the most popular. And maybe, you know, in this example, again, if you aggregated all of the events together, they actually got more traffic than the homepage today, even though I bet that if you looked at a single event, it, it probably didn't score, you know, super high. So let's look at, so that is um, top content. Another thing about top content is that your top content tends to not change very much. Similar to what I was saying about your geography, it's not something that you need to look at every day and expect to see wild changes. Probably your homepage, your about page, your contact page, your, you know, there are certain things that are going to show up in the top kind of no matter what. So don't stress too much about you know, what order they're all in, you kind of want to look at things that change over time. So if you have a new campaign, if you have a new page, is it is it rising in the list? Are there new things that have popped up in your top 10? Are there current events that are showing up up there that, that weren't there before? Kind of look at what, look at what's changing because over time you're, again, your homepage is probably going to be first. Your main service pages are probably going to be in there. Um, you're not going to see a, a wild swing from like day to day. 
So the next content path or content report we're going to look at is called navigation paths. Let me go over here. I don't know why my chat is open. I'm going to close it. Um, let's see. So if I'm in content and I go to, let me go back to my all pages. I'm going to click this little tab in the middle called navigation summary. Okay, so this report is really fun and it's sort of hard to read. So I'll, I'll walk it through with you. So you can see my current selection is just a plain slash. That means the homepage. So this little guy in the middle is the homepage. This little page icon represents the homepage. All of the things to the left of this represent pay, what pages people went to right before they got to the homepage. So, and it, you can see entrances, 71% of people just started on the homepage. And that's pretty normal. Again, a lot of people are going to land on your webpage for the first time on the homepage. But for these 28% of people who didn't start from the homepage or you know, maybe they click somewhere and click back or whatever, these are the pages they were on before. Now for the homepage, because so many people start on the homepage, I'm sort of going to ignore the left side of the page and go over to the right side, which shows me what pages people went to after the homepage. So you'll see that after the homepage, 28% of people go to the dinner page. So that's, that's important information to know. Where do people, you know, where are people going next? What do people care about? And some of this is based on what they care about and what content you're showing them. So if maybe you made the dinner button really prominent, then probably people are going to click there more. Um, events, tour, brunch, lunch, you can see kind of what pages they're going to next. So if there's something on this list that you wish were higher, make it more prominent on your homepage, make it more obvious to see, move it, you know, up a little higher, make the button a little bigger, a little more obvious. And if there are things here that aren't so important, maybe it's time to rethink like your navigation structure or, you know, kind of what, what, um, if there's something that people are going to a lot that is not really important to you and you don't really want them going there, then either make more, th make other things more prominent or try to figure out, you know, what information are they looking for that they're going there to get it. So like hours and directions, you'll see full menu, the story, um, lots of good content here. You can kind of see after the homepage, where do they go? And you can pull this report for any page. I can see this little drop down. I can change it and say, you know, from the dinner page, where did people come from before? Where did they go to next? But the homepage is really probably the most valuable um, piece of this report. So on the homepage, where do people go next? Okay, so what, again, what do I do with this data? I have all this data, what am I supposed to do with it? Uh, again, is it what you expected? If you see something that's really popular that's popping up, this is an example of shipple.com. And shipple.com, you'll see that our homepage is actually in the middle, it's number five. And all around it, you'll see things like help files and you'll see these quotes links. And so a lot of times if you see random pages that show up above your homepage, that's because for whatever reason, people are really, in, they're searching for things around that topic, they're finding you probably in search results. So like this, how do I transfer my old iPad data to my new iPad? That's just sort of a random help file that we created. Well, people in the search engines are Googling, how do I transfer my old iPad data to my new iPad and finding that content. So if you see random content like that, that's sort of sticking and it's really popular, you'll see a lot of these are around Facebook. So a lot of these random ones that are up here are Facebook. So that tells me that people are really interested in content about Facebook and how do I do things in Facebook and can I add more content around that topic that's related to us that sort of, you know, gets people in there. Another thing that you can do is, so you'll see seven and ten are quotes. We have a quotes module on shipple.com. We love to share, we love to share quotes with each other. We love knowledge sharing. Um, you'll see this is kind of what the quotes module looks like. So we've got all these quotes in there. We get tons of traffic from these quotes that are probably people that will never buy a website from us, but for, you know, they're searching for these quotes and they're interested in and they're looking at it. So what we have done is we've added these share buttons underneath so that if somebody does want to share our content, you know, if they did find it interesting, they can share it online and maybe they're not going to buy a website, but you know, maybe the next person will, or maybe, you know, that sort of gets our brand out there and gets us, gets us out there in the community, makes it easy for it to be, be shared. And um, we've also added these tags to the quotes down here. So 
If they're interested in quotes, they may be interested in reading more quotes. So this quote is tag politics. It shows me right below it a couple of other quotes that are tag politics. So maybe they'll spend a little more time on the site. Maybe they'll, you know, look at a little uh, more pages. They'll they'll um, maybe share our content, maybe get our name out there a little more. So you kind of want to see if there are popular topics. How can you take advantage of them? How can you add more content around that topic that's related to you. And if there's stuff that's missing that you think, oh, I really, you know, I really thought that this was really a really great article that we wrote and it's not showing up there. How can you make that content more findable? You know, maybe people aren't able to find that, or maybe, maybe it's not as interesting as you thought it was, you know, maybe you should go in a different direction. You sort of have to, um, test different things, watch it over time, see what, try different things and see what works for you. But these are some kind of questions to ask yourself as you're going through this data. So we've talked about content. Now we're going to talk about keywords. And um, the, the analytics keyword report shows you what which keywords are bringing in traffic to your website. So I'll show you how to do that. So we're going to go into traffic sources. And we're going to go into... Well, here, I'll show you this. So if you start from the overview, you can kind of drill into it. It shows me keywords right here from the front. Um, I tend to go into sources search directly just because I think it's it's easier. But um, if you want it, you can click on, sorry, you can click on traffic sources and kind of drill down your way in there. Um, you'll notice that it is, I'm going to flip back over to ten tendency. So you'll notice that it's showing me all search traffic, organic and paid. Um, if you're doing pay-per-click campaigns, it's going to show you sort of everything. I'm going to click into just organic because I just want the organic traffic. So organic means, you know, not paid. It's the it's people who it's you naturally showed up in those search results. Um, so you'll see some, you'll see lots of not provided for us for whatever reason. Again, we try not to try not to stress out too much about that. Um, but you'll see some things. This is a blog. So in blogs, you'll see all kinds of weird things. <laughs> let me go to, let me go to tendency.com. Okay. So on tendency.com, you'll see tendency, tendency.com slash nonprofits, membership management software. You know, you'll see some, you'll see some good keywords that, that people are searching for things around tendency. Um, so you want to see, again, very similar to the content, are there, are there, is it what you expected? Is it what is your main, you know, we have membership management software. Is that, is your main kind of product category in there? Is your brand name in there? You know, kind of what, what content is in there? If there's something that's missing, how can you add more content around that key term? Or how can you make the content you have al already sort of more, more findable? Another tip, if you're looking at keywords, is go to advanced. And you want to exclude keywords that include your brand name. So what I'm going to do is click exclude keyword containing tendency and click apply. Tendency is kind of a funny word. If you're typing that in, you probably know who we are. So again, how I was talking about how those strangers are a little more valuable to us. We want more strangers because they're new. They don't know who we are. Um, if I exclude tendency, then I'll see these keywords that just have the kind of stranger keywords. These are people who didn't know who we were. They were looking for a nonprofit social media strategy and they stumbled upon us. So this is a good way to see um, if excluding your brand name will sort of clean some of that out and let you look at what we call them non-branded keywords. Just who, you know, what are those stranger, what are those, what are those, um, those keywords that are bringing in new people? And you want to look at, look for any surprises, look for things that very similar to our content, how we were saying, oh, well, you know, we saw these help files around Facebook. How can we bring in more content around Facebook? Because that's what people really care about. Look for surprises. Think about ways that you can incorporate, incorporate those words. So what do I do with this data? Again, what keywords are missing? Can you add content around those topics? What keywords are sticking? What new keywords are you seeing? This is an example. This is Chimp Haven. And they are a chimp sanctuary in Louisiana. And when I look at their keywords, you see Chimp Haven, Chimp Haven Shreveport, Chimp Facts. Um, number seven is careers with a primatology degree. So they took this data and they said, oh, people are, you know, people care about 
careers and maybe maybe we could use the website as a recruiting tool. So what they do is then they posted these videos of some of their keepers and some of their staff members talking about what their day-to-day -day job is and what they, um, you know, kind of what they do with the chimps. And it was a great opportunity for them to say, oh, this is a keyword that's kind of sticking. People care about this. Let's add some content. Let's add some video content around this topic because obviously it's something that people care about. Some more content brainstorming. You want to think about things that are interesting. Um, people love top 10 lists. That's why BuzzFeed is so popular. You know, 27 reasons why you should love, you know, whatever. <laughs> top 10 ways. Anytime you can piggyback off of hot topics or things that are in the news. This is GNA Partners blog over here. They do HR um, outsourcing and they are, do a great job of anytime there's some HR scandal or, you know, HR, HR issues, they will talk about it and have commentary on it. Um, infographics are fantastic. People love infographics. People love visuals. Um, how to's and FAQ's are a great way where you may say, well, you know, my business is not that sexy. There's not a lot of, you know, really interesting infographics out there about my business. You, if you can create some sort of FAQ's or um, how to information, people within your industry will latch onto that. That is something that they'll find interesting. That's a good way. That's an easy kind of content to kind of tailor to your to your business. Another good way to to get your content out there is to tag people. So if you talk about other people, chances are they're probably going to share it. So if you're talking about maybe one of your one of your volunteers or one of your donors or one of your partners or one of your customers, um, if you talk about them online and say, you know, it's sort of the internet runs on karma. If you if you talk about them, you include information, maybe show pictures of of um, one of your a bio on one of your volunteers, probably that's not only going to be good for you to show off this volunteer, but it will be good for them and they'll probably share it with their network and that might bring you some traffic. Also, anytime you can talk about local content or um, another important one is revisiting or updating popular content. So if you have a blog post or an article or something that's really, really popular, maybe you can do a part two or maybe you can make it a series or maybe you can turn it into a video or maybe, you know, maybe there are other ways you can use that that content. Um, this example down here, GNA does hiring horror stories around Halloween, and they post they posted it once with these kind of they collected stories from their staff, and they posted some funny interview stories of you know things that happened, and it just blew up. Every it got shared all over the place. They got tons of traffic from it. So now they do it every single year, and they you know they may post two or three in the month of October, and they kind of it's now a running thing because it's so popular, and they're getting lots of good traffic from it. Um, the next piece of this is if, again, if there's a keyword that you that you don't see that is not showing up in your Google Analytics, the best thing you can do is incorporate that keyword into your content. This presentation, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this SlideShare presentation is on optimizing your tendency site for SEO and kind of what options you have. What's There's a lot of SEO built into tendency, what's built in, what's already done for you, what kind of do you need to do, what do you, what, what, um, what customizations can you make to your content to incorporate these keywords? So um, check that presentation out if you haven't already. We're probably, you'll see it's in the old tendency red. So you will, it's a little bit, it's probably about six months or a year old. So we'll probably be re-giving that presentation soon. But um, this is a really good, a really good resource. So now we're going to talk about conversion tracking. So until now, we've been talking about pulling reports and sorting them by visits. So which keywords bring in the most visits? Which content gets the most visits? Which, you know, referring sources gets the most visits? Well, now we're going to talk about conversion tracking. So in Google Analytics, you can set up what's called a conversion. There are three types or goals. There are three types. The first is URL destination. Um, that is the most popular. That is, so say... If somebody fill, you want people on your website to fill out a contact form or to donate to your organization or to fill out a volunteer application, when they get to the end of that form, there's probably a confirmation page. And so what you do is you add that confirmation page as a goal. And you say, if somebody hits this confirmation page, I know they filled out my contact form and I, you know, I want to count that as, you know, they've converted, they've, they've reached out to me. So for Shipple, for Tendency, they've reached out to us. Maybe they want a website. They count as a, you know, they count as a conversion. 
And then the other two types are time on site and pages per visit. So you can say, if somebody spends five minutes on my website, I want that to count. Or if somebody goes to this many pages per visit, I want that to count as, you know, they've converted, they've spent all this time on my website. I typically tend to recommend using the URL destination and to do a confirmation page because those are people that they took an act, you know, they sort of time on site can be passive. Maybe, maybe they're reading every piece of content. Maybe they're not that URL destination. They have to actually do something. They have to go, you know, make it through the process. So I recommend setting up URL destination. And what that does is you can also create these funnel graphs. So I can say, okay, my contact form, 72 people made it to, they went to the contact form page. 62 of them dropped off, they left, but 10 of them actually filled out the contact form. So you can look at things like funnel conversion rates. If you have a long form that has two or three pages, you can add every page of them to this funnel and you can see that data. So how do we do that? I'm gonna go back into analytics. And this is in the, let's do it for the blah. Well, we'll do it for tendency. So you go to admin over here, click in, and then you'll see this goals right here. And it's going to load. So you get five sets of four. We have a whole bunch of goals on tendency.com because we have a whole bunch of contact forms. Um, but we're going to pretend like we're going to add a new one and click create goal. I'm going to call it contact form. Uh, destination URL. And then essentially what you do is you say, again, when somebody hits this confirmation page, then I will know, you know, I will count them. So the easiest way to do this is to go to your contact form and fill it out and figure out what the, you know, go through it as if you were a person and fill it out and see what the steps are, write down the, you know, copy and paste the URLs directly from the process. If you're using tendency and you're using a um, and you're using a tendency contact form like this one. Um, the way that tendency works by default is it just adds slash sent to the end of the URL and that's the confirmation URL by default. You can change it and you, you might have changed it or your project manager might have changed it. So it's always good to, you know, double check and fill out the form to be sure. But probably if your URL is, you know, if it's a tendency site, it's slash form slash something, the confirmation page is going to be just add slash sent to the end. So I'm going to go back over. I'm going to add my confirmation URL. And then I, you know, I can assign a value to it. Here's my funnel. I can turn my funnel on and I can say, okay, if they went to slash form slash sales, that's the actual form. So this is where you can add, you know, as many steps as you want in the process and click create goal, which I'm not going to do because I've already set this up, but that's how you add goals. And then once you've added those goals, now you'll see this little tab up here that says, goal set one, goal set two, you get, again, you get four sets of five. So we have, we're using pretty much all of them. Um, but now when you click on this tab, it shows me data, not just by visits, but my goal conversion rate as well. So for all of those reports we've been looking at with keywords and content and all of that, we can look at not just, you know, did this bring in traffic, but did it actually bring in, bring in conversions? Did people actually fill out the contact form? Did they actually do something once they came in? So like these keywords, if I sort by conversion rate, you'll see, and some of these are weird, <laughs> you'll see um, some of these words that are maybe not, not the ones that are getting the most amount of visits that are actually getting a, a pretty high conversion rate. So that's goals. I think this is the last little section right here. Yeah, we've got two more sections. We're about an hour in. We'll probably be another 20 minutes or so um, through this. We're going to talk a little bit about A-B testing. So Google Analytics allows you to see not only what's going on in your site, but to test things. I recommend if you're going to test something, try to test. So for instance, we're looking at the top content and maybe you see, oh, well, this page is, is not showing the top content and I want to you know, rearrange my home, my homepage or rearrange my navigation or rearrange my whatever to see if it makes a difference. Try to test one thing at a time just so that when you're looking at the data, you can actually tell, oh, that's what affected it. Because a lot of times we run into this trap of because our websites are so easy, you know, because websites are kind of easy to change around and update, we try to change too much at once and then we're not quite sure which thing made the difference. So try to do one thing at a time. Try to let it run. Your test run for, you know, a couple of weeks. A month is better, but a couple of weeks is fine. And just kind of see if it if it made a difference. 
So this is something that Ed Schippel, our CEO, always says to me, there's no such thing as a marketing argument, only a marketing test. You can't argue anything in marketing. You can only test it. So there are two um, A-B testing tools we're going to talk about within Google Analytics. Um, the first one is the Google URL Builder. And what that does is it lets you build a URL, create a URL that's got tracking code on it. So you can use, it makes each URL unique. So even though these two buttons go to the same donation page, I can make a unique URL for each one so I can tell which one got the most clicks, which one had more, you know, more engagement. So the way that you do that is you go to the Google URL builder and it has a long crazy URL. So I always just Google it. And here you go. You see, it's a support crazy URL. So what you do is you type in, you know, let's say we're going to do tendency.com. You pick a campaign source, you pick a campaign medium, and you have to pick a name. So like the source may be homepage, the medium may be banner, and the name. And so this is the part that would be unique. So, you know, maybe we call one of them red button and one of them tiger. And when I hit submit, it gives me this crazy URL. And so it's got all the, it's this regular URL plus tracking code on the end. So in this example, yeah, we've got two. One called, this one's called red button. And I think this one's just called donation header or image or something like that. Um, so you can generate two different URLs. And then when someone clicks on that URL, it transmits that data back to Google Analytics and shows you and, you know, tracks each of those separately. So to get to the information under in analytics, we go to sources and campaigns. And again, it shows each one separately. So red button, 391 visits, tiger donate link, 88. So you can see which one got the most traffic. And we're actually doing this on, um, we go, we're doing this on tendency.com. So like if you hover over the demo now button on the top, if you look really closely down there on the bottom left, it says, slash try now and it's got that source medium campaign. So I, I'm actually doing that right now. So when I go into our analytics, I can look and see how much traffic came in through that specific button. Cause the, the demo now link is all over the website and I can see which ones came in through that specific, you know, specific place. And in, a, in analytics, it's under traffic sources, campaigns, and then anything you've tagged shows up over here. You don't have to add it in analytics just by setting up the URL. When somebody clicks on it, it transmits that data back. You don't have to like add all of your campaigns in analytics. It will sort of automatically do that for you. But here's my try now button right here, 155 visits. And then you can see some other ones where I've, I've tagged different things. So that is our first A-B testing option. Um, the second one, and this one is pretty new. This is called Google Content Experiments. And the way that this one works is you set up two different versions of the same page. So again, we're doing this for Tendency. This is uh, two versions of the same pricing page. And you can test them. You add the original page, and then you add kind of each, each separate version of it. And you can add up to, I think, I think, you can add as many versions as you want. I just did two in this example. And you add a little snippet of code to your first page. And what it does is you tell Google, you know, show send 50% of the people to this, you know, split them half and half. Send half the people to version A and half the people to version B. So what they do is you don't have to change anything on your site. You don't have to change your navigation. You don't have to change anything. When they click on this first page, it's got the little snippet of code in it. And half the time Google sends people away to the new page and half the time they let them stay. And so Google does the segmenting for you and Google does the tracking for you and Google does it all for you and then outputs this report. You know, the original page has had 50 visits so far. They went to this many pages per visit. They spent this much time on the site. The second version has the same number of visits and this is kind of what they're doing. So this is a really, really neat um, tool and it's pretty new in the last like six months this has come out so and that is located if you want to if you want to play with that it's pretty easy to set up it is under content and then experiments so let me let me pretend like i'm going to create a new one so again enter the url for it's got a little video it's got enter the url that you want to improve hit start experimenting and it walks you through the process of um you know 
what percentage of traffic do you want to play with? What metric are you going to use to define success? You've got some advanced options like how long do you want the test to run and then some configuration stuff. And it, it pretty much does all of the heavy lifting for you. So this content experiment is very cool. The, the basic thing you need to know is create two versions of the same content and then Google will kind of walk you through the steps. So this content experiment is really easy to use as well. So the last piece of information we have are just some other resources. If you are interested in learning more about Google Analytics, if you want to play with more tracking tools, um, Google has a fantastic support documentation kind of platform, support.google.com slash analytics. They also have a blog where they talk about new reports and new things that you can do in analytics. Um, also, if you're interested, lynda.com is a paid service they are um, we use them internally i think it i can't remember how much it is but it's not it's not super expensive and you pay monthly so you could do it for just one month if you wanted and they have all kinds of training on software and their google analytics essential training is really good it's super detailed it goes through like every single report in analytics so if you're interested in learning more about analytics these are great resources to do it um, if you're interested in playing with more tracking tools these are a couple that I really like. Um, Bitly, many of you may be using Bitly for your URL shortener for Twitter. Um, what you might not know is that Bitly also has pretty good tracking tools. So I can go to any Bitly URL and I can stick a plus sign on the end of any URL, no matter whose it is, and I can see data. And you can see things like the number of clicks and what time of day and who shared it and how many people and where they were. So sometimes if you, you know, if you don't necessarily want to go through all the trouble of creating that Google URL builder and figuring all that out, sometimes I'll just make a bit.ly URL and then I can see that if it's something quick that like, you know, I just want to post this to Facebook or I just want to post this to Twitter and see which one performs better. Creating a quick bit.ly URL and then looking at the data there is often kind of an easy, quick way to do it. So Bitly is a great tool and it's fun because you can sort of spy in on anybody's Bitly URLs and just add the little plus sign and see anybody's data. And um, the other two are add this and share this. And what those do are they add those little widgets at the bottom of your page where, like I showed in the quotes module, where it lets people share your content. And what that the advantage of doing that is that they don't have to copy and paste the URL and add it to Facebook. They can just share directly from your website. And then also these widgets give you... Um, give you sharing data. They give you analytics data on how many times content's been shared and who's been sharing it and all that good stuff. So those are fun as well. Um, a new tool that I've been playing with recently is crazyegg.com. And Crazy Egg is a heat map tool that shows you, this graph on the right is our pricing page and it shows you, it's based on um, where people's mouse sit. So the studies have shown that wherever someone's mouse is, that's where their eyes are, tend to be looking. And so it shows you kind of where people's mouse, mouse's mice hovered and kind of what, so you can see like there's a really hot spot right here and you can see there's a hot spot right here and you can kind of see what people on your website are looking at. You can also see how far down the page they scroll. So this report on the left is a scroll report. Green is 100% of the people. Red is 75% of people. Yellow is 50% of people, and then there's more colors down here for, 50, you know, for less, fewer number of people. So this report's really cool because you may see, you know, someone spends on average 60 seconds on my pages, but does that mean that they spend all 60 seconds at the top or do they even see the content on the bottom? Um, so this is a cool tool. It's, um, you can get one page for free. You can set it up and kind of play with it on one page, so like on your homepage for free. And then if you want to do more pages, it's $100 a year for 10 pages and, you know, kind of goes up from there. So this is a, this is a fun new reporting tool that I've been playing with. Um, let's see. So that is the end of our of our of my presentation. Um, if you want to keep up with more on Tendency, follow the Tendency blog, blog.tendency.com. We post all sorts of updates about Tendency, but also we try to post things about managing nonprofit websites and nonprofit technology and all, and all that good stuff. So follow that there. If you are a Tendency client, be sure to sign up for the Tendency newsletter. We'll email you out about upcoming trainings and new features and all kinds of good stuff like that. That's at tendency.com newsletter. 